Sure, my name is Dave Ward. I'm, the, I'm a CTO, CTO of the engineering group at Cisco across the whole portfolio and chief architect of the portfolio. Uh, Rick is on my team, and so we, in my group, we primarily focus on bleeding edge technology, the next gen of products, uh, both hardware and software, although mostly software to be honest, and also have the developer program in our group, as well as academic research, open source, and a wide variety of external activities across Cisco. Cool, thanks Dave. Kelly? Uh, Kelly Ahuja, I run the uh, service provider business, uh, which includes both products and solutions uh, across the entire portfolio. Uh, work with the engineering team, um, he tells us what to build. Um, I help the engineers productize it. Then we go take it to market. You also pay for it. I do pay for it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so why don't we start with you, Kelly. Um, uh, can you tell me a little bit about some of the things that are happening in the service provider business, uh, and some of the interesting things that you're doing? Sure. Uh, so you know, basically, what we're doing in the service provider side of the house is really focusing on uh, addressing our customers' needs. And when we talk to customers, typically they tell us they're focused on what, three things. One is uh, improve their top line, profitable revenues, not just revenues, profitable revenues. Second is lower their cost to serve. And the third is improve their agility. So all of the technology innovations that you see in this area are really around those three things, which is either help them drive more revenues, uh, a la cloud VPN uh, discussions that are going on here, lower their cost to serve, which could be any one of the things uh, that's out here with automation, tools, programmability, uh, et cetera, and agility. And agility is all about how do we innovate faster with them, how do we develop things faster with them, and how do we roll out things faster. And you're going to see tons of tools around automation uh, that are around the DevNet area, which are focused on that as well. So a lot of focus on those three things, Rick, and that's what we're driving. Now, okay. the entire portfolio that we're pushing across uh, Cisco is really focused on not just products, but also taking those products, either physical or virtual, and capturing them into um, solutions. So for example, um, you know, virtual managed services or cloud VPN is an example of taking virtual samples of things and physical samples of things and connecting them together to create a business value. So go drive a new service or a new way of offering an old service with much more profitability. Service providers aren't just telcos or cable companies. You're looking at a much bigger picture a than absolutely. just Absolutely, and I, I look at, when I say service providers, I mean service providers that own infrastructures and providers of services that actually just offer services that don't own any infrastructure themselves. Could be uh, HBO, uh, could be, uh, who else uh, you want to pick on? Netflix, uh, could be somebody else. But the second opportunity that I think exists for the service providers is really with the Internet of Everything. I think the Internet of Everything, uh, if you watch Carlos's um, keynote, uh, I, I think it's ripe to disrupt value chains that have existed forever. And that's where the true opportunity lies for profits, not just for service providers, but for all of our businesses. Because we can create new value chains or disrupt old value chains and create a tremendous value opportunity for all of us. Okay, so let me go out of the audience here. So this is your first chance to get a scarf. Anybody here work for a service provider or somebody who is in the area of services? Can I show of hands? Okay, right over here, here is the first one. So the first scarf over here, do you have a question? See, I put you, see, you have to earn your scarf here. So we just heard uh, service providers a growth area of opportunity. You got Kelly here, you can ask him anything you want, um, including free equipment, anything. Just your chance, no, I'm kidding, I'm free equipment. Go ahead. Yeah, um, we hear a lot of talk of, sorry, I work for 3 UK Mobile. Yeah. Um, we hear a, talk, a lot of talk about uh, NFV and how it's going to change the, the service provider um, way of working. Um, it still seems a little way off to me. What's your thought in terms of you know, the next two to three years, what it's going to look like? Yeah, so there's a lot of activity in virtualization today in the service provider area. Um, and um, many of them are, are focused on uh, not if, but how or where. Uh, and most of the things, feedback I hear from service providers is, they would rather not take a risk in virtualization in some of the core parts of the business. They want to try it either with a new thing or a kind of a confined thing, uh, operationalize it. Because virtualization, the biggest challenge with it is, ver is operationalization. You're going from siloed constructs of operational boundaries to horizontal constructs of operational boundaries. And that's not simple. You're going from um, defining or finding problems in a physical world to uh, tracing problems in a virtual world. So many of the tools, uh, operational procedures, who runs the data centers, uh, is it IT or network, all those issues have to get resolved. 
uh, or have to get, kind of evolve. So what we see happening with virtualization is the following thing, which is one, um, one, one operator told me in Europe, they said, you know what, just because you virtualize something, you haven't solved the business problem. So virtualization for the sake of virtualization, forget it. Because if you virtualize my chaos, it's still chaos. So um, <laughs> that's a quote that I always remember. Virtualize chaos is still chaos. So we have to take virtualization and solve a business problem. So the areas, particularly for mobile operators, the virtualization is really kind of coming up, is one, uh, building machine to machine networks, where uh, the ability to have an elastic way of, of scaling up a network, a mobile core network, to be able to uh, get to many sensors or devices, and then elastically bringing it down, or br bringing it, sharing it, uh, that's an area that's, that's certainly very popular. The other part that we're seeing it is not necessarily in the, in the broadband core, mobile broadband core, but in the GI land. We're starting to see that the GI land is getting very complex and it's very static, so making it more dynamic and making it more virtualized is gonna help with that. So those are two areas that we're seeing it, particularly for mobile operators. Great. Dave, Dave you wanna add anything to that? <clears throat> sure, yes. in addition to just looking at mobile operators, um, the, some immediate opportunities that we've, we've seen and we've built have been around video delivery, whether it's video on demand or on uh, broadcast TV or cloud DVR. But what is a huge opportunity, I think, over the next couple of years is that we'll see, we've talked a lot about private clouds and we've talked a lot about the big public cloud with the Googs, Azures, et cetera, et cetera, out there. But there's a huge space for a provider cloud to emerge because they're hosting the VPN Frequently, they're hosting uh, enterprise class data centers already and providing that intermediate point where a provider has its business based upon quality of service, SLA agreements, and that's not what you get from the public cloud. There's no cycle completion times, there's no guarantees of bandwidth, et cetera, but this is what the traditional infrastructure service providers, uh, that's their bread and butter, that's their business. So the emergence of this uh, provider cloud, um, which is part of our inner cloud strategy, you might want to talk a bit about yep. that, Kelly. That's where I see a huge window op uh, opening up. The business opportunities, and, and again, Kelly, I think you can describe this better than I can, emerge not only as hosted solutions, but also the new business models of as a service and being able to buy it by the drink. Now, the fundamental different uh, new user experience that's going to come out of this is that many of these virtualized services can be completely user driven. I would like a firewall. I would like a load balancer. I'd like access to box. I'd like some WebEx. I would like to have an enterprise class video. The fact that you can now orchestrate these virtual appliances, virtual service chains without an EMS, NMS architecture, which is uh, a lot of what uh, a traditional telco focuses on, but do this now in an orchestrated manner using the pillars of SDN, NFV, cloud and orchestration, tying those together for a user driven experience uh, directly from the consumer directly into the cloud, I think that's what we're going to see emerging uh, technically. Yeah, and, and I think broadly what, what Dave talked about and I talked about is fundamentally one thing, which is being able to deliver service on uh, instance, right? That's essentially what we're talking about. Uh, network as a service or functions, NFVs as a service, uh, but doing them very quickly, right? That's where virtualization really helps. Uh, the ability to be able to put on new workloads, any workloads or new services, scale up or scale down in any service, uh, that's where it really helps. Uh, the last point I want to add to this is that I think the on-prem device is also going to fundamentally change. You know, let's say it's a Cisco ISR. These are relatively, yes, they're feature complete. They have an, almost an infinite number of features in them. But a lot of folks uh, are going to want to be able to choose to be able to have some of these virtual appliances running on-prem and have that be orchestrated either in conjunction with what's going on with a cloud or within local branch or on-prem traffic. That model, um, which we've built and you can see behind that, that wall over there, um, is absolutely a new model that's emerging and have a combination of both virtualization, NFV, on-prem, and, and again in the cloud. It's true, and business and consumer as well. Consumer, uh, as we all know, uh, what's interesting about consumer is that the scale out of the millions and millions of, of residential consumers means that um, it's going to be interesting to see how the tenancy works within a home or across groups of folks. And this is all state-of-the-art state of bleeding edge um, work going on in NFV because it's pretty easy to understand how a business has a single tenancy associated with it. But residential, when you get into the millions, tens of millions uh, of residents in any particular country, 
means that the scale is going to be different. We, you may or may not, not have an individual firewall per home. Uh, you might need to have, rather like you see in the large physical appliance firewalls, multiple tenancy, but now you need to see it in the virtual space as well. I think Rick wants to give cool. out another scarf. You want to, I do want to give out another You got scarf. giveaways? Uh, we do have tons of giveaways, and you can see we're not going to be able to do many giveaways because one question spurs on a lot here. So who else has a question or a follow-up to that? Great question, by the way. We have one over here. Awesome. You can ask Dave where he got his socks from? No. <laughs> so um, with this uh, uh, programmability and virtualization work that we are doing, do we see like our service providers are looking for a partnership in that development area as well and and how far ahead they are in terms of the infrastructure or talent that they need to kind of build that partnership with us. Do you want, so from a business standpoint, um, every operator is realizing that in this new world, it's going to be very difficult to do things on their own. And we're developing a new sort of uh, uh, partnerships, but a very new different way of doing partnerships, which is an ecosystem is emerging, not just of uh, technology vendors and service providers, but of a whole ecosystem of players. If you look around this room here, you're going to see a whole lot of players that are actually not necessarily technology vendors uh, or service providers, or come from different areas, application developers. So that ecosystem is fundamental to be able to make any one of these business propositions succeed. So I'm going to answer the question a little bit differently. I think the, the question back to a telco uh, or MSO or any service provider, content or otherwise, is who's going to be the system integrator in the future? Traditionally, service providers have been the complete system integrator of all equipment, um, of all software, et cetera, billing services, oper OSS systems. And the question becomes with respect to partnership is are there turnkey solutions to get somebody to win the race? Because I do see the next, next three years, three to five years, the fast movers are going to be, once again, like in the mid-90s, late 90s, the fast movers are going to be the ones who catch a huge part of the marketplace. So then, service provider needs to ask themselves, who's going to integrate this for me? If I'm going for a turnkey video-on-demand solution uh, you know, for, for, my, for my customers, can I get a video pod that can deliver a million HD uh, VODs uh, at one time? If you took this on yourself, that would be a massive amount of work. You'd have not only on the business uh, partnerships that you're alluding to, Kelly, but also just on the integration work themselves. Perhaps this is the same with, in mobility with GI LAN and, and Evolve Packet Core. It is, but also applies to enterprise, too, because if an enterprise wants to lo launch a new capability, um, you know, they can either do it themselves and take on all the complexity of doing the integration, or look for a partner that I can sh and actually deliver it as a, as a service, perhaps. Yeah, I agree, and we, we certainly see that trend going on you know, taking a look at large financials, large multinational institutions that want to outsource all of their IT, this becomes a whole new business, in particular for those uh, service providers with a global footprint. That's right. Cool. Another scarf? Another scarf. Nathan. Earlier today, one of our services colleagues came to me to ask what we can do with them for them to help them prepare to deliver services to our partners and create the new solutions that we're looking for. So what should I tell our services colleagues when they're thinking about how to evolve their careers and create new skills? So uh, new skills are required uh, across every one of the areas, every one of the functions. Um, in in, in uh, the services areas particularly, uh, I think the X as a service models are absolutely fundamental. And as you do that, um, you get into a, a new skill set of what we call development operations combined into one area. So DevOps is an area that uh, is completely new and a new area for uh, enterprises, uh, service providers, and for technology vendors. And I think that's where an opportunity uh, lies for services, is to figure out how to make that possible. The biggest, the biggest reason why that's needed, is, as we were talking about, is speed, the fast innovation and the co-development models. So that's one area that we have to do it. Uh, and in service providers particularly, uh, the ability to be able to uh, add new capabilities uh, and do it at a very fast pace does require continuous integration, which is very common in the cloud world, and we've got to bring it to uh, uh, the network and the application world as well to be able to drive it to that, that speed as well. Dave? So I'm going to answer it a little bit differently if I was a services engineer. Um, 
I would begin to plan my career to think about being a full stack developer, or at minimum having expertise in, in a certain layer in the stack, but have full stack awareness of how you plug in your talent, your skills, your, your engineering capabilities into the entire, whether it's NFV stack or, or SDN piece. Um, no longer can somebody be solely focused just on one widget. They, they have to understand how it fits into the greater system around it. So, you know, as, as a CCIE or, or walking around Cisco Live, um, it is really understanding that although you see lots of individual solutions, they do fit into a, a larger stack model and a larger stack framework. And I think that's absolutely key for somebody to turn themselves not only from being a network engineer, but also into a services engineer. That's right, because in the past, the services um, business used to be associated with a project start and a project complete, and now it's a, pro a life cycle, right? And that's where the opportunity lies for the services uh, kind of skill set, is how do you go from a, a time-based project to a lifelong project? And this doesn't mean that everybody has to be a Java programmer, Jenkins, Puppet Chef, or some of these DevOps tools. You do have to have awareness of it, though, and you have to have awareness of how it plugs in and how to interact and interface with those folks, and that, that is a broadening of the skills. So, uh, Dave, we, we're talking about building skills and what the CCIEs can do for the future. What are some of the things that Cisco's doing for those folks to help them? Funny you ask, Rick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you want to get out of your way? No, no, no. So, um, so what we're doing is, uh, and, and Rick, you, Susie, we, who would be here, except she just had a brand new daughter, um, but was uh, with us in Cisco Live US and will be with us uh, going forward. We've been trying to catalyze the developer community around networking. To be fair, I'd say the networking industry is the largest industry of its size without a developer community and without an ISV community. And those are two pieces, the difference between developer and partner, and, and we can discuss that if you like, Rick. So to catalyze the developer community, we've actually taken a number of, we placed a bet on a number of different tables, but there is a, a, a strategy around them all. So we did build out DevNet, as you know. You're successfully employed, Rick. Congratulations. Thank you, um, thank you. But in DevNet, it was more than just, uh, here's some APIs and throw them over the wall. That is pretty early 2000s attitude towards software development. So we, we have changed our portfolio, and this has been a massive amount of work within engineering to actually build them out as platforms. Instead of just use the API, for which even inside Cisco, you'll find tens of thousands of APIs saying here is your manual for tens of thousands of APIs is not that useful for a developer. Instead, it's how do I use these, how do I use these as a platform if I'm trying to do something with Colab or IoT or video or security or the rest. But just having a fancy website isn't going to solve that either. That's rather 1990s if we took that approach. So we decided to try and build off of these APIs and platforms um, sandboxes both in the cloud as well as personal editions, and focus these at different levels. As I talked about the full stack developer, there is a platform and development suite and sandbox for the DevOps folks who are you know, advanced admins, let's say, uh, up and down the stack. We also focus on network engineers uh, who, who are trying to understand across multiple devices how to program to them as well as controllers and orchestration layers and built out the virtual internet routing lab, both in the cloud and sandbox edition, and that's what the previous speaker was just talking about. Um, but it didn't just start and stop with a couple of tools. We've worked with, this, with Gene Dunn and CCIE folks to bring on uh, Cisco modeling labs as well, and from there you have the ability to take coursework, take tests, and begin to build up that skill set as a, as a developer on top of not only our APIs and platforms, but in particular our partners. And so when we bring in, an, when we bring in the ecosystem that Kelly was talking about before, now part of our strategic uh, business agreements with them and strategic technology agreements is that they join into DevNet and have their APIs and platforms and those partners are plugged into ours as well so that way when you're, when you're coding to the, or when you're developing a solution or developing an application to these particular um, platforms and APIs, you're also working with our entire partner community. But wait, there's more. Um, Dave. I, I'm getting there, Kelly, yep. yep. <laughs> Kelly would like me to remind that to have, at, but I'll, let me get there. So, um, so 
couple of other things we've done, and we've realized that there's an opportunity, not only as an engineer or IT professional, when you write an application, you need a way to verify that it works against those APIs and to be able to certify that application. There's very little chance that you'll be able to put something into a live network if it's not proven already because you could do some, some damage. So we've got uh, our IVT program, which is a validation and testing program, um, but also beginning to build out these app certification programs for developers and partners. So in addition to the platforms, the APIs, the sandboxes, the, the labs that we have, you need to get this stuff into your labs. You need to, I mean, you're an engineer, and you're not gonna believe me for however long I stand up here and tell you how great these platforms are and these opportunities are unless you can get it into your lab and kick the tires. And that's where a program we've launched, Dev Innovate, um, and Dev Innovate, what it is is we are providing a half rack of kit, computers, storage, switches, routers, depending upon the kit that you want to pick up and depending on the size, and we provide for an annual subscription license all you can eat of all of our SDN applications controllers, all of our NFV solutions, all of our orchestration platforms that are downloadable directly from the web that have a direct correlation to what's available out of DevNet, and so as you code to those APIs and platforms, you can drop it directly into Dev Innovate and get to that co-dev model that you were talking about, Kelly. Great. You want to add to that? No. Nope. Rick? Uh, well, I will add that, uh, so all the things that Dave just talked about was the first year of working for Dave. So everything we put together started in last December, so we're actually 13 months, okay? So there's a lot of stuff that we're trying to do for the CCI community and the developer community, but let me pose a question to all of you. Does anybody have raise your hand if there's something that you would suggest to us on, hey, guys, you really need to do this to help us in this journey. Okay, great. Let me uh, come along with the mic microphone. I've got a suggestion, Rick. Yes. No, no, go ahead. Okay, yes. <laughs> Get Dave a scarf. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Peter. Uh, we are, I'm assistant auditor in um, government, like a public service. Among us, our work with this uh, and the IS audits, like after virtualization, because we look at different systems deployed by government for the various sectors. Then after, they depend on us to give positions and the uh, um, security recommendations and everything for the system that government has deployed in various entities. Now, our concern is when you look at all the tiers for, for the so-called stacks, you have to recommend according to each stack, right from the protocol, the networking protocols up to the application. Since DevNet is now the hub for some of these challenges, I suggest that you can address some of these technologies to address the auditing perspective. You know, yeah, when you're dealing with your infrastructure. You know, that's an outstanding point. Um, so, so let's just talk about open source, the quality of open source, and being able to describe the security or just overall quality of, of the inter, int, integration or introduction of some of these tools into, into the full stack. What is very interesting, and we've all watched in the news over the last year, a lot of the vulnerabilities in, in open stack come to, come to you know, the forefront in trade rags and the news and the rest of it. And what did not exist until six months ago, as strange as this sounds, is any open source foundation focusing on that critical infrastructure. So as an example, OpenSSL, that, the bugs that we saw come out six months ago, there are effectively four developers on OpenSSL. And so, um, what we did with the Linux Foundation is we formed a critical infrastructure initiative where ourselves, as well as Intel, Dell, HP, we got all of the Valley big companies together to chip in money such that we can evaluate the security associated with these open source pieces. And when we, and we chipped in this money such that if we need to hire software engineers to go and fix that code and make it secure and, and close some of these bugs, that could happen. As strange as this sounds for having open source available to all of us for 20 years, let's say, just for conversation, 
It just started six months ago. We've begun working with the Linux Foundation, Apache, Eclipse, to be able to come up with a notion of a quality metric of that community, quality metric associated with that code, vulnerability assessments. And what we've taken on at Cisco is using our P-Cert system for open source that we use in our products, and we, we also put out P-Certs associated with these open source pieces as well. So we've, you know, everyone is, is used to uh, receiving P-Certs and understanding that they're critical bugs that, that are either in the network or that are about to, or have fixes associated with them. And so we've uh, partnered with the industry to continue to use this. So I, I do appreciate the, the comments um, about the use of open source in these tools, but still, what, what I've found in, the, in either an NFV or the use of DevOps tools, the most common security vulnerability is passing passwords in clear text. We haven't got, you know, as, as critical as OpenSSL was with buffer overruns and being able to crack random number, number generators, we're still at some pretty basic levels of actually building these solutions out. And so I think where you, what you said in your comments earlier, recommendations of how to use these tools securely, guidelines of how to use these tools, Rick, we don't have that page in DevNet. Yeah, and so don't. we need to admit that yeah. we can tell people how to write code well, how to write code securely, provide those guidelines, as we do internally to our own engineering That's teams. Yep. Well, and there's also, I mean, security is, is uh, going to be, a, 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 it's already a huge concern, but I think as we look ahead, it's going to become even more of a concern, not just in the data center and the open source models, but even in the fundamental network. Uh, and it's always a, a, a chicken and, and um, egg game around which comes first, the vulnerabilities get exposed or somebody figures out how to you know, kind of do the things that they do. And we've got to stay ahead as an industry. We've got to kind of continue to evolve. Um, some of the demos that you'll see downstairs in the world of solutions, there's one on autonomic networking that you should go take a look at. It's really about how to make the network secure. Right, but network security is only going to get us so far. We have to focus on content security. We have to focus on physical security and also the other areas of application security. So security has to apply at every one of these layers. And um, a cohesive way of uh, showing that is probably something that we should look at in DevNet. Cool. But right. for example, Rick, in DevNet, we don't have how to use P off, O off, any of these other mechanisms around uh, either passing passwords, doing logins to the different devices that are there, how to use Puppet Chef Jenkins, et cetera, et cetera, in a secure way. I, I think we can write a couple of those chapters and help out. That's great. Do you great want more actions? Great suggestion. Um, thank you. So who else um, has some questions or, or some advice or things that we could do better for all of you? So I get another action item on my list for something to do next year. <laughs> Don't be right shy. Right there, Rick. Ah, perfect. So um, we know that everything is running on software, um, and software quality is a quite big point in, in our business uh, as a service provider, because most of the outages we have are based <coughs> on software problems, bugs, whatever. So what is Cisco doing in the future to improve this software quality? Because if we are talking about internet of everything, connecting everything, putting everything into clouds, losing the control of the console. We need to trust the software. So what can we do um, to keep everything up and running? Sounds like one you should take. <laughs> Why don't you go with the quality and issues, <laughs> sure. and I'll, I'll add sure. something to that. So, so the traditional view of quality that we took in Cisco was that we need to make sure the box, the product, has good quality. And uh, we've done a lot of, uh, in the past, measures around uh, you know, we've got a huge bug backlog, we've got to go beat the engineers into you know, improving the quality to reduce the backlog. But now it's a different world, right? It's no longer just about the box itself. Its quality has many other associations. In fact, when I look at some of our CSAT scores, some of the quality concerns that come back are not about the bugs, they're about how do I use the box? The usability is, is, is a quality issue, or performance is a quality issue. And it's not just about a box, it's about how the network or a solution sort of evolves. So we're actually taking a very different approach to quality now by measuring the engineers, measuring the systems teams to be able to deliver not just a box, but deliver how a box would get used in a network and test that network profile and deliver the software and the hardware to you once that's done, right? And we're actually, uh, one of the simplest things we did, uh, and this is universally applied across the, all, all the engineering team, is get the engineers to establish what we call a universal release <coughs> criteria. 
which is before a software release ships, they have to be able to say that I will only ship this release when it meets certain criteria, certain number of SEV 1s, SEV 2s, and SEV 3s, typically zero SEV 1s, maybe a couple of SEV 2s and SEV 3s. And until the software reaches that point, uh, and in the software world, as you know, you've got to really continue to test and converge uh, and bring that down, you don't ship the software. It requires, more than anything else, requires discipline in my view, and when we apply that discipline into the software development methodology and the testing methodology and a release criteria, you should start to see results. We've started to see in some areas, there's other areas we still have a, a bit of work to do, and you probably know which ones they are. So Rick, I'd like to add to this a little bit as well. So through the course of time, if you've been with us and, and use Cisco equipment, you realize that we have frequently have had bifurcations in multiple trains of the same operating system for different, of our, different platforms. Um, we solve this in service provider space with iOS XR and focusing one operating system across the, the service provider portfolio. And patchability. And Next patchability, up. of course. Um, we announced at Cisco Live San Francisco last spring that we have an operating system to go across our entire enterprise line. Folks who are using our data center equipment realize that we're still working to, to converge the, the multiple uh, different forms of NXOS to one unified form. <clears throat> Now what we've also done towards this end, just reducing the train, reducing the complexity of operating a network, and reducing uh, the num overall number of bugs because it's frankly just less software, uh, we've also added a couple of pieces, and this kind of gets to the DevOps piece. You, you probably noticed, and Kelly, you might want to talk about this, we did do a major restructuring inside Cisco between, uh, and creating at the foundation of, of our traditional platform groups our ASICs, hardware, et cetera, at one layer, on top of that embedded OSs, where, <clears throat> where we now have a unified way to communicate via APIs in and out of those OSs instead of just using command line interface. On top of that, we built a cloud and virtualization group, a single place where our software applications, Meraki, IoT, security, video, and mobility, have a single way to interact and orchestrate across multiple, de multiple devices that are using a single set of APIs across our embedded operating systems to deal with, uh, deal with things holistically. Now what you also get out of this, and many folks who, have, uh, who, are, have been, who are professional developers realize, and this might be in, inherent or uh, immediately obvious, the approach that we need to build our embedded OSs and platforms follows a fundamentally different development model than our cloud and virtualization group and the applications above. So we had, where we had taken acquisitions or technologies and put those into platform groups, we realized, wait a minute, they aren't following the same waterfall type model of development. Instead, they're following the Dev DevOps model, where we need to be able to rapidly adapt to not only requirements, bug fixes, et cetera. And so by creating this hourglass organizational design and engineering, we can unleash the traditional software businesses, again, Meraki, IoT, security, video, mobility, to be truly DevOps and have our platform teams follow the model that you mentioned, Kelly. Uh, that's true. <clears throat> so um, one thing you should know about quality, um, it's top of mind for the engineering leadership uh, and our compensation uh, depends on making sure that we actually deliver good quality as measured by our customers and our partners. So it is always top of mind. Uh, we do fall off um, the road at times, but then uh, we've got to get back on track. So the heavy area of focus. The other thing that Dave mentioned is the development methodologies that we're moving to and the tools that we're starting to, to move to um, in certain areas are actually going to help with the quality improvements. Being able to do uh, agile sprints uh, in certain areas to be able to deliver software a lot faster with smaller releases will reduce the complexity of the releases that come in, uh, but operationally, it'll be simpler and easier to deploy. Uh, and also doing uh, you know, as a service type offers will actually help maybe uh, ease some of the deployment pains as well when it comes to quality. Great. I, I will add one thing. So we talked a lot about improving the quality of Cisco software and, and the internal efforts that we're doing there. There's another element here is that the third party applications that are working with us that are using our APIs, right? So one of the things Dave mentioned is make our APIs simpler to use, provide the tools so developers can more easily develop to them. But then the second part is the testing. So what we announced in DevNet uh, just this last month uh, is we're opening up a testing program for applications that are using our, our APIs. 
Um, when we go to intercloud and we start hosting apps, this is gonna be more and more important, testing these third-party apps. And we're reducing the cost of testing for developers by 50% in the first year. And we, we hope by reducing the cost, making it easier for them to test together with Cisco, that the applications that work on Cisco platforms that Dave mentioned will be much more reliable also. Okay. Yeah, and, and one of the simplest things that we're doing, Rick, just yes. to add to that is um, moving to a model where the developer that writes a software actually writes the test cases yep. and automates those test cases as they, as they develop that software. And at the system level, then there's system level testers that actually write the test cases more at the system level. Exactly. So approaching it that way as well. Perfect. So Rick, the last thing, I, we haven't mentioned this enough today, is that um, we're also trying to catalyze a community around these pieces. So we do provide repositories where folks can share and work on code, and we've taken a fundamentally different strategic view, back to our colleague's question earlier on open source, we've taken an, a much more active role in the last three years in open source to catalyze the community, the developer community around networking. Whether it's Open Daylight, op, Open NFV, Open Stack, um, and there's actually about 30, uh, actually 48 different consortiums now that we help fund as well as we put active resources into those communities, again, to be able to put code out there that folks can, can work with as well as cat, begin to catalyze the community of professionals around those particular subject areas. Cool. Is anybody using some of that open source stuff that's out there? Anybody a member of those communities? Okay. Do, do you have any questions about what we could do more with those communities? Can I put you on the spot? Either of you? Um, are you talking here about the DevNet communities and the open source software up, up there or are other communities? Uh, so one more time, in Dev Innovate? Wh which, uh, which communities are you speaking of here? So the communities in particular, um, we help catalyze Open Daylight, OPNFV, we're active in Neutron, uh, which is part of OpenStack, um, but it also can, in, continues into W3A, Cable Labs, and again, these are, these are large open source communities. We've joined Onos, uh, which is another open source community around uh, controllers of the WAN. Open Compute. <clears throat> open Compute, of course. And so these are all places where we actively have placed um, our engineers into those communities, and they're responsible for developing to the community and not necessarily onto Cisco platforms or APIs. Um, and the DevNet libraries, these are not open source. So if I look at the uh, 1PK libraries, for example, those are closed source. Those are closed source. But the APIs are open. <clears throat> now, what's interesting, uh, Rick and I have been working on this, which is that not trying to, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, take over any open source community, but actually provide training tools, the sandboxes, um, and, the, and the learning labs around these open source communities. So you can come in and use our resources to actually get yourself trained, use the applications at the top of, say, Open Daylight or interact with OpenStack, et cetera. And by doing that, <clears throat> we're just try trying to facilitate, again, more people working with these tools and more people working with these APIs and platforms. Cool. We have another question here. Um, one question on... Um um, self-healing networks and uh, performance monitoring um, on the PKI, on a performance key indicator in a multi-vendor, multi-domain. So we will expect from Cisco some self-healing uh, network solutions? So uh, across multi-vendor, so the answer is yes, and the answer is because, uh, let me put it this way, a couple of acquisitions that Kelly's made are specifically multi-vendor. So. We've kept the Keratin acquisition from up to two years ago, multi, uh, heterogeneous networks and still working multi-vendor. We've kept TLF, uh, specifically heterogeneous and multi-vendor. And Son. that's, what's that? SON. Correct, and SON as well space, in the mobile yeah. space. Um, and the point here really is that the fact is we have to work in the world and the, or work on the big eye internet. And the big eye internet, when you look across service providers in particular, it's a Noah's Ark of equipment. There's two of everything in the boat, it's guaranteed, that's ever been built in the history of Telco. And so these systems are still out there. They still need to be operated. And so we're, we've strategically made sure that a, a couple of these pieces are kept heterogeneous. Again, to be able to pull stats and provide KPIs, but also just to be able to config, monitor, and administer these devices. So, so from a strategy standpoint, we have definitely shifted to being more multi-vendor centric in any of the tools and any of the things that we acquire or build ourselves. 
The second part is we're also open to working with other parties that may have more subject matter expertise in certain areas that we may not. But the idea is that we provide the right sort of information through APIs, open APIs. We expect other vendors to adhere to similar kind of a approach of open APIs. And you can gather that information and then make tools available, applications available through an ecosystem, uh, some that we may do, other partners may do, to be able to take that information and present it the way you would like. And uh, it, an example would be our storage partners, yeah. whether it's NetApp or EMC. UCS Director works with That's those right. and we need to have solutions that include, of course, other partners and heterogeneous vendors. Exactly. Yeah, uh, actually, um, I was thinking about that framework you, you display uh, last year on the self-healing networks, like the old cycle, deploying uh, service assurance, monitoring, and again, a correction on a self-healing. So probably Cisco is uh, the leader in this to drive such a solution due to the complexity, yeah, and. So in particular, um, since, let me give you a concrete example of how that manifested itself this year. We built a module into uh, TailF's uh, NCS product, and that's their, their uh, multi-device orchestrator called Reactive Fast Map. And what this means is that as you're receiving statistics or events or logs from a device, or you're trying to provision them, if an error occurs, regardless of the vendor, it has the ability to self-heal, react to what happened, and then fast map it into a new solution. So, for example, if you're uh, swapping out gear, let's say Juniper to Cisco, and you have the Juniper config running in your OSS, we have the ability to automatically fast map it directly into Cisco, and vice versa, as an example. But also where it becomes interesting is if you hit out of resource conditions when provisioning, when you hit a specific event, um, we then can take reactions that we couldn't before to try and, again, self-heal that network and keep it going. And a colleague of mine in the back, Giles Heron, has a very, very interesting application, in this case, also built on top of open source and open daylight, where he's able to, again, even in open source, react to the state of the network and keep the network alive and running. Cool. Okay. That was two questions. Do you need two scarves, or is one okay? <laughs> One's okay? All right, good, good. She's not greedy. <laughs> Very nice to put up with me here. Okay, other questions. We have about 15 more minutes before we wrap, but, ah. He's going for another scarf. Another wow. scarf. <laughs> I'm good with a scarf. You know, but take thank one you. for someone at home. <laughs> I could do that. Um, I just wanted to return to the open versus closed source question, if that's OK. Sure. Um, looking at the viral tool, which I've used quite a lot, um, I believe that's built on the Eclipse platform. Eclipse? Eclipse platform. Uh, it can, yes, you can use Eclipse tools. Great. Um, and is that tool itself uh, closed source, or are you, are you again planning to make that open source? Uh, we're not planning on open sourcing all of viral. So we'll open source pieces and components of it. Auto Net Kit, which is uh, part of it, is, was an open source project, continues to be. We continue to push into that. But the overall framework itself um, contains a lot of work that we did. Um, but that being said, um, go again, talk to Joel. <laughs> and uh, Joel's not here right now, but Is we have other folks from Viral. Oh, good. But for example, uh, some of the plugins to the Oculus Rift that you see over there. So yeah, we hacked that up, but uh, we're not open sourcing that kind of stuff. But modules of it, we are. Yeah. The, the only point I was going to make is that from a point of view of speed of development, that, that can be a good thing to do. And I, I'm wondering why you'd want to keep that in-house and, and not speed up the development by, by open sourcing it. Uh, a number of pieces have to do with licensing of the virtual machines inside it. And other parts of it is that there's a whole lot of work that we put into it as well. And so, um, although we're not charging a ton of money for the viral personal edition, it's a, you know, it, it is built out of my group and it's enough to cover expenses, to be honest. Cool, thank you. Yep. He's not staying away from controversy, is he? Yeah, yeah. bring it on. <laughs> okay, who else wants to bring it on? These are, this is the time to ask your tough questions or what do you need? from Cisco. Somebody want to give me another action item? Great. So Rick, as you walk over there, I had my hand raised before. Yes. So if we have validation and testing programs and we're trying to catalyze a developer community, are we catalyzing a place where folks can put their applications and potentially sell them to other folks or build a community around their tool themselves? We, we are. So um, that's a very good point, Dave. And one of the things we want to do for the future 
is to uh, provide opportunities for developers. So uh, things like app stores and marketplaces uh, is gonna be something that you're gonna see from Cisco being announced here in the next few months in the upcoming Cisco Lives. Uh, we wanna give developers an opportunity if they develop a cool and innovative application, how do you get to market? How can you leverage our field and channels? How can you leverage uh, you know, the Cisco communities to get your application out there. So that's one of the future things that we're gonna be doing. So opportunities for develop. So one thing is making it easier for developers uh, to get access to your tools and resources, making it inexpensive, making it easy to test. But then once I've developed an application, what's in it for me, how do I get my application out there? And that's a key mission of DevNet is to try to find new markets for, for cool But also provide a, loca a home for that open source community as well. Yes, absolutely. Two questions now. Two questions. One in the so back. we had one there, and then and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Okay. Cool. Scar first. Okay. Um, uh, in my line of work, I do basically development. I'm mostly dev part than uh, net, <laughs> net part. So I don't know much about network. But uh, what I've uh, gathered uh, while playing with one PK in particular is that uh, certain older equipment is not supported and uh, as I've seen other APIs uh, also older equipment is not supported are there any plans for supporting the older equipment uh, particularly hardware switches and routers and etc because uh, uh, with our customers they have uh, mainly uh, older equipment and it's very hard to make them start to use uh, new equipment because as far as I'm concerned I will I would uh, do everything in software, I will buy everything new, but it's hard to uh, tell customers, okay, for this shiny new product you need new switches, new routers. Yeah. Are there any uh, plans for uh, legacy, legacy hardware support more? So what's interesting about your question is that um, whether or not they have to buy new hardware, no matter what to get access to these APIs, 1PK, NetConfyang, et cetera, et cetera, they have to upgrade software. And so perhaps as hard as it is to, uh, I know this from my career, it can be very, very challenging to have customers actually upgrade their software because the box is just working. And so this is one of the most fundamental challenges we have and have introduced our APIs with, version, with releases of, of the operating system. But generally what we see is the uptake is actually off of new equipment. So the answer is yes, as we continue to support more and more equipment, of course not things that are end of life or end of sale, but, uh, but things that are still supported, um, they have to upgrade the software to get it. And that means that they've got to have a support license and all the rest of it to be able to get those upgrades. So the answer is yes, more equipment is, is becoming available, but uh, there's, still, there's still work to get access to it, even on that equipment. Okay. Ah. So um, we've got a very successful, Cisco's got a very successful network academy program. And I think, you know, if I look at the sort of skills that are taught there, they're traditional networking skills. Um, I'm doing a talk at Cisco Live in Melbourne to the network academy group around skills for the future. And I was wondering if you could give me a sort of heads up around what you think the, the essential skill sets are in that next generation that is coming through, given the tremendous changes that we're seeing. Sure. Um, I, I think I'd go back to the statement that I said earlier. You have to, as an engineer, you have to think of the full stack. You have to know how your position fits into it. So, so that could mean that I'm a security engineer. I need to know not only how to run the particular firewall or IPS or DDoS or what, whatever the case might be, but if you're running it both physical and virtual, you need to un have an understanding of how it's orchestrated. You have to have an understanding of the, you know, how, how to, to have service assurance from an underlay as well as an overlay. You have to have a basic understanding of what OpenStack is and how the applications on top are working on top of it. I'm not by any stretch saying that everybody suddenly needs to become a programmer at all levels of the stack, but you have to have awareness of these different pieces depending where you are. To our colleague in the back who's more of the dev than the net, um, the, you know, the reverse is true as well. You could be Puppet Chef Jenkins, et cetera, et cetera, or an OpenStack developer, um, or writing to an orchestration or writing service models, but you also need the ability, you have to have the knowledge and awareness of what you're trying to program, what you're trying to accomplish in the reverse. 
And the traditional problem that I think we've run into is that, and again, I've seen this over my career, there's sysadmins, there's application admins, there's net admins, there's storage admins, there's security admins, and everybody had their little silo. Those lines, those lines are really gone. They're very, very blurred. And the more you know about the stack around you, and you the more you know about that solution, and some of the tools that your colleagues are using, the better you're gonna be able to interact with them. And so again, not everybody has to become a specialist or a hardcore coder, but they have to know enough to be able, you know, being able to read code is excellent, to be able to understand what the events, logs, alarms are coming out. Um, those are the critical skills. I'm not gonna say it's Java. I'm not gonna say it's Erlang. I'm not gonna say it's XYZ language. You need to become a functional programmer, et cetera, et cetera but you need to know enough of what's going on around you to understand how you fit in, how to be able to influence what somebody else is designing and building, as well as continue to be able to debug it and to be able to understand it. But one thing you didn't mention that I would add, which is how uh, what you're doing ties to a business value for whichever, whether it's an enterprise or a service provider, whoever you're working for. That translation, I think, is a very important skill set that all of us have to develop and learn. Great. He's yeah, got a follow-up. Follow -up. He, wants, he, another he scarf. wants another scarf for his wife. <laughs> He's got a friend at home. <laughs> no, no need for a scarf. Um, and what about the, so if I look at the, the sort of current state today, you know, it's, everything is fairly tightly coupled today. And if I think about people coming into the industry for the first time, I think they're, they're coming in with a fresh set of eyes. So mm -hmm. that notion of loosely coupled API integration, those sorts of things, do you think that's an important thing for them to focus on? 100%, and some of the best way to do it, we'll talk about the, the current network engineers. Um, our colleague mentioned, use the virtual internet routing lab. Those virtual, the virtual routers and switches inside operate just like physical ones, but now they have APIs and controllers, and you can see this work. Open Daylight's in there, NCS is in there, a number, all these tools are in there. It is a development environment to be able to you know, begin to test and learn. Now, if you're coming in with fresh eyes and you think the highest level of programming is, you know, writing something into Facebook, um, I, I apologize to the younger generations, but uh, you can see some, gold <laughs> some gray hair. Um, you need to realize that there are a lot of other APIs and platforms below what you're writing. And I, and I see this as a lot of fundamental misconceptions. Um, for example, there's been a lot of services put up in Amazon and a lot of services put up in Rackspace, very easy to code to, but you have to realize they, they, they come at, at with a lot of other things below it. So as easy it is in, in AWS to say, give me a load balancer, there's a service chain that's being built. There's addresses that are being allocated. There's resources that are being used. And to our colleague who talked about NFV, state-of-the-art engineering can't tell us yet in a mathematical model how many compute uh, memory, storage, and network resources are required for a terabit of X. And then if you wanted to optimize a terabit of X, which would fit on, let's say, three racks down to one rack, what is the proper placement of those virtual machines that interact together? Do you need to repel them off the same CPU? Do you need to have them very close to each other because they're very, very chatty? Those types of things, again, with the fresh eyes view, an understanding of what happens underneath is going to be, a, is going to be able to, to build a solution that I'm not talking about the ultimate optimal, but certainly the best you can possibly engineer. And, and having that depth of knowledge is key. Great. So we have room for one last question. If not, we'll wrap up. Does anybody have one last burning question, or anybody want a scarf? So I think we got everybody that wants a scarf. Great. So Dave hey, so Rick, actually, I have a oh. question for you. Yes. <laughs> because you've worked across the community. Of the platforms and APIs that we have out there, what are the most popular ones that you see that the community is currently using? That is a great question, Dave. So I didn't it, even set them up for that. No, but, uh, no, because I, I asked this question yesterday to so, so my, my staff. Uh, so I came from collaboration, and this is a really interesting question. So collaboration was by far the number one area for people uh, to grab uh, you know, tools and APIs and things like that. Now, I came from collaboration. That's where we developed that developer community. But this year, since the onset of DevNet, uh, SDN uh, with Viral and 1PK and some of the uh, APIC-EM stuff that we've got out there. So our SDN area just surpassed collaboration, uh, which is kind of cool. Because 
SDN was nowhere a year ago. Uh, I mean, in terms of developer program for Cisco, and that just bypassed collaboration, which was kind of cool. And I, I, I probably bet you that the second one is location-based services on Wi-Fi and, and, and Internet of Things space. Con as connected well. mo mobile experience after that is becoming very big. Uh, we think the future, uh, which is going to be really hot towards the end of the year, uh, as we start getting new more products, is going to be IoT. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you come up to DevNet now, by the way, one of the changes we just made in the last month, we're getting out of like Cisco products. So we don't say come and get 1PK. We say come and get our tools for SDN. Come and get our tools for, I, for uh, IoT, Internet of Things, collaboration, et cetera. Um, so to answer your question, SDN is bypass collaboration, which used to be the most popular. CMX is very close, uh, which is connected mobile. Uh, but we think IoT is going to be the big thing towards the end of the year. So there's one other program we added actually in the last two weeks leading up to this show. Um, we've talked about access to APIs, platforms, sandboxes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all the demos that you've seen here at the last Cisco Live, Cisco Live US, all of those are now available for everyone to actually see it work as well because a developer program is a lot like sometimes booting a router. You boot the thing up and you get a blinking prompt. You go to a developer community and you get a blank text screen and fill code here. And uh, a lot of times just seeing how these things work was we found to be key. So folks could edit off of that and get those to work. So we put dcloud up and made that accessible. And that's our demo cloud where everything we've written, product or otherwise, that we're working on, prototypes, et cetera, et cetera, we're putting into dcloud and that's now off the DevNet page. That is all off the DevNet page? Yes. Yep, yep. So, uh, which brings me to my last, because we're at the last minute. Unless, Kelly, do you have anything you want to add? If not, I'll wrap. No, I'm good. Okay. I have one last call to action <laughs> for you. So, Dave mentioned that everything that you see out there uh, on the floor is available on DevNet. So, if you don't have time, you can go home and you can visit developer.cisco.com to get it. Except but for Oculus Rift. Except we're not for Oculus Rift. We're not and the soccer the ball. We have no way of doing the soccer ball uh, up on the cloud. But uh, so one call to action is, please go out and visit the area, go meet with my people, get engaged, learn the stuff. If you don't have time, please visit us on the cloud. And my ask is that just register at developer.cisco.com, join up, sign up to our mailing list. You'll start to get information on all this new stuff that's coming uh, forward. So uh, if you go to the registration area, you can log in and, and uh, register there. And then for those, I think, that fill out a full profile, uh, we not only have scarves, but we have t-shirts, right? So if you get online, and I think we have a short window of a few weeks, that if you get a full registration, you'll get a DevNet t-shirt too. So that's my call to action for you. Thank you very much to our executives for Thanks, making this interactive. Thank you. Thanks.